So welcome everyone to our From Script to Screen Producing Independent Films Seminar. Um, we're here with Ken, Greg, and Rachel. Um, uh, we are doing this seminar to raise some money for the American Diabetes Association. I can drop the link in the chat once we get started. Um, but let's start by having each of the speakers talk a little bit about how they got started in film. So let's start with Ken, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and talking a little bit about your background. Sure. <clears throat> uh, my name is Ken Cosentino. I'm from Niagara Falls, lived here my whole life. Um, I picked up a video camera when I was 10 years old, which I'm part of the last generation to uh, not have cell phones. And you know, I remember when we got a computer and stuff. So nowadays that doesn't mean anything because everyone films when they're a kid. Um, I had an apprenticeship when I was 15 with a guy named Fred Calandrelli, who is an awesome producer, robotics expert, doing TV commercials. And then uh, when I was 18, I made my first feature film. I got into a film festival in LA and I went there and mingled and uh, got a full experience. Um, I made another movie, uh, feature film, uh, my second one called Crimson, that Greg Lamberson ripped apart uh, while I was filming it and uh it's kind of how we met actually we met before that but um then i just started making movies features and uh i made a lot of shorts in 2012 there was a like the start of a production boom and uh that was pat kaufman who was the state film commissioner and the unsung hero here because uh she got the uh the tax incentive uh going and um, her husband lloyd came in and filmed a trauma movie called uh, Return to Newcomb High in the Falls. Um, I had a studio right next to where they were filming, so they hired me to produce the behind the scenes documentary. And then after that, I was hired uh, by the DP for Battle Dogs, which is an asylum movie that Greg worked on as the uh, first AD. And um, I was the DIT on that. Um, and then after that, I was the first AD on an, another asylum movie called Atlantic Rim. That was a horrible experience and uh, very, very, very educational. Um, and that was it. That's how I got started. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Greg? Uh, my name is Greg Lamberson. I live in Cheektowaga. Uh, I grew up in Fredonia and always loved movies. I knew from the time I was in seventh grade when Star Wars came out, I'm not afraid to date myself, I'll be uh, 57 in April, that I wanted to direct. I went to New York City where I went to film school for one year at the School of Visual Arts. Uh, I dropped out because at that time, a lot of uh, 16 millimeter horror films were playing in movie theaters around me. And that's what I wanted to be doing, not making short student films. I often mention that the day that a classmate did a Super 8 silent film about his Starlog magazine collection was the day I realized that film school wasn't necessarily the way I wanted to go. I made three films, three features in New York City. This is when you had to shoot on film. My first film uh, was Slime City, which has become a, a genuine cult film. You shoot on 16 millimeter, even if you get a camera for free, you have to pay for uh, developing, processing, work prints, negative cutting when you do an edit. I had a, a Steenbeck editing machine on my porch for a year. So uh, it was much more challenging uh, to make a feature with very little money when I was 21. Um, I salute Ken for what he was able to do on Crimson. And I run a film festival. I've been running one for 10 years and I meet filmmakers every year who are making feature films on $5,000. And if you can write, direct, shoot, and edit with today's technology, that's possible. It wasn't an option for me. So I had to, I had to go the old tried and true way to, to raise money from investors and, and make this film. But uh, I made three films in New York City. I moved back to Western New York 17 years ago. Uh, the film career never went the way I wanted it to do. And I came back basically to write novels. Uh, that I hoped I could sell as film or television properties. And I, you know, I've had a few options and I have six under option now. And that went pretty well, but then the digital technology came out and I just couldn't stay away. So I, I did my first Buffalo feature, a sequel, Slime City Massacre, back in 2009. And I think I was the second feature that Tim Clark sort of shepherded as film commissioner. And 
Um, I actually think that my film and some films that Peter McGinnis was making were the first features in the area to pull in all these different filmmaking groups and, and get started what took off from there. Um, Lloyd came in, Battle Dogs came in, Debbie Rashawn came in with Model Hunger. I mean, there were a whole bunch of films that came through in a short period of time and really got this going. But myself, McGinnis, Ken, handful of people were really in on this from the, from the get-go. And besides making our own films, we worked as crew members on these other films when the opportunity presented itself. So uh, I'm getting ready to do my ninth feature this summer. I run a film festival. As I said, I'm an author. Uh, I find that by juggling all these different things, I can sort of claw out a living, although there, there are dry spells. I, I call myself a semi-professional because sometimes I make money on these projects, sometimes I don't. Yeah, no, that's awesome to hear about how all of this initially got started because now I feel like there's always a movie in town. I know with COVID, obviously things slow down a bit, but that boom of movies has just really been feels like nonstop ever since I came in and I'm a lot younger, but hearing that you were working with Tim Clark, who is obviously one of the um, film commissioners with Rich Wall, who was always involved in everything, to hear about the beginning of that is something that I feel like we don't really hear about that often. So thank you for sharing that. Well, I, I can tell you that when I was managing one of the dips in movie theaters, we had a different film commissioner, Mark Strickland, who I, I guess was very popular, but the features were not coming. And I remember the day that they shut the film commission down and whatever position Tim had, he scrambled to get financing from all sorts of different agencies to keep it alive and basically taught himself the position and reinvented it. And, and Rich came along later. But Tim was a one-man show at one point, and now they're a two-man show that, that should probably be a four-man show because there's a lot of work for these guys to do. Wow. Yeah. Rachel, how about you? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear me okay. Um, great. Awesome. Nice to see um, some of my friends' names pop up on here. Kyle Ferchin, how you doing, man? <laughs> um, great to be here, though, with Greg and Ken, you know, both you guys, you know, I salute you. You've been working tirelessly at this. So thank you for kind of paving the way. Appreciate that. Um, I am a young filmmaker, though. My brother and I, uh, Addison Henderson, we uh, produced a feature length film here about two years ago called G.O.D. And that's where I finally, you know, got my first taste at producing movies, filmmaking, um, really the hardcore stuff that goes behind fundraising money for your movie. Um, I think that's what really... <sighs> something that uh, changed my life as far as filmmaking goes, to know that there are people out there willing to support your vision. Um, that's kind of where I'm on my own path now. I uh, just did my first short film last November, um, the weekend before Thanksgiving. It's a uh, fantasy thriller film. I also co-wrote it with uh, Rosalind Kazmaier, so uh, she's my co-writer, but um, it was all self-funded. It wasn't much money, but we had a budget that, you know, went way beyond our crew. I mean, like the crew was awesome. We uh, were able to get visuals that, you know, would have cost tens of thousands of dollars. So um, that's kind of like where I'm at right now, getting my feet wet. Um, I know my brother can't be here with me right now, uh, but uh, we both really learned a lot making films here in Buffalo. He did two documentaries prior to his feature length film here. Um, and just kind of watching a grassroots filmmaker and in, involve the community, I think, has been very awesome. Um, it's a really community-oriented uh, task that goes into making a film. And I'm sure people want to know, how do you get the people together? How do you get extras and have people volunteer to come out and, and be a part of something that, you know, came from your mind? Like, how do you get that to happen? Um, so I'm really looking forward to sharing about that today. Um, and I also have my partner here. He's a filmmaker. So if you have any questions, he's willing to answer too. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. Congratulations on G.O.D. Congratulations you, on G.O.D. I haven't seen thanks. it. I heard great things about it though. I know there was a lot of excitement about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it was a push, but you know, it was a great product at the end of the day. So thank you. Did you shoot in the, were you at the police station in the falls? Yes, the abandoned police day. Oh, one of my yeah. favorite sets, hands down. Didn't have to do much to it. Yeah. It was just what it is, you know? So 
Yeah, we, it was awesome. we, my company actually locked in that location for you guys. Bill Kennedy did it. Nice. Oh, love Bill. Yeah, he's awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. Great location. Maybe someday we'll meet. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> Be on the screens. <laughs> Thank you all for being here again. Like, it's great to hear from everybody who's been out there doing it. Um, so um, I know you just mentioned your short film that you recently did, Rachel. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about the initial process of taking an idea that you have and turning it into a screenplay? Of course. Um, so the initial uh, process with that, well, first of all, it's convincing someone else to be your your co-writer right and she is awesome she's an author as well she writes children's books um Rosalind and um I think it was just that moment maybe that that last moment that I convinced her I, I might have put in the plug maybe three times before but it just some happened to be in sync with the moment that we were in at that time so just um convincing yeah my co-writer like let's do this let's step out on the limb let's show them what we got you know it's like we can do this. We've been watching it for so long, like, let's just do it. Um, so that was the first uh, part to that. Um, and then also, you know, finding a DP willing to volunteer their time and also create a crew for us. Um, there's no way me and her would have been able to direct it or DP it on top of writing and acting in it. But finding a crew that was willing to, you know, accept just the rental fee, you know, and, and volunteer the rest of their, you know, two days to our project, that was one of the first steps. Um, and then on top of that, just finding locations too. Um, and that helped, to, that helped to shape the screenplay because then we could kind of visualize, okay, where can we do this at? And how can we write it? Say if we wanted to write in a drone shot for it. Um, that was, um, those were some big pieces that added to the screenplay itself. And then also formatting, learning format for screenplays too. That was a big, a big thing for me um, as one of the main writers. So, yeah. Awesome. How about, how about you, Greg? Do you do something similar to Rachel where they kind of figure out like a location that might work for it and then you kind of write around that? Or do you just have the idea in your head, write it first and then try to figure out everything afterward? You know, it's different from project to project. The first one I did in Buffalo came as a result because a, a producer was going to hire me to direct a film in the Central Terminal, which I had never seen. You know, now everyone knows the terminal. People shoot there all the time, but it, it really opened my eyes. And I ended up not doing that film, but the location stayed with me. So in that case, it inspired a screenplay, a post-apocalyptic screenplay. Um, but my scripts are usually begin with characters and... I strongly believe that the screenplay is the most important step of the process. You can make uh, a decent movie from a so-so script, but you can't make a really good movie from a so-so script. And I spent a lot of time rewriting. Uh, that comes from my background as a novelist, doing editing, just rewriting, rewriting, rewriting. I, uh, I, was, I had been developing a project for three years that I was planning to do before the pandemic. Um, with a lead role, I had planned to offer to Rachel, as a matter of fact. And it just was not logistically possible. I'm a very prolific writer. I have so many scripts that I, not only have I not produced, but I've never really considered producing. I've, I've written a script. I've put it away for one reason or another. This one that I'm doing this summer happens to be 90% outside. So that's why I pulled that one out really at the start of the pandemic. And I have rewritten it religiously right up until the crowdfunding campaign started i worked on that script every single day i know it's the best i can do that's really the one stage in the process where you have absolute control where outside factors don't deter you where you don't have to make compromises at the end of the day where the shots and the editing in your head can be on the page if you want them to be. I know some, some people say no camera angles but uh, in my case because i know i'm going to direct my own scripts usually I usually put uh, camera angles in there. I actually wrote a screenplay for hire at the beginning of the pandemic. A friend contacted me about writing a screenplay for him. And uh, my process is usually I develop the characters, I let the story percolate for a couple of weeks, and then I can write a first draft in two weeks. Um, if I had the connections to be in Hollywood and work on a TV show, I'd, I'd rack it up because I'm a fast writer. And usually um, my rewriting process is editing stuff down more than making changes that filmmaker 
actually was able to shoot his film in September in Ohio, where they had less severe restrictions. Uh, it was interesting to just be a writer and see how somebody else was putting something together. And they ended up going to a Western attraction town where they were able to shoot for free and they got horses and costumes and props and just so much production value for what I believe is a $20,000 film. And I can't wait till that comes out. Um, but to me, that the script is just so important. Yeah. How about you, Ken? What is your process like when it comes to taking your idea and turning it into a screenplay? Um, <clears throat> like Greg said, it, it, it changes from movie to movie, uh, depending on what I'm doing. When I've, I've written, directed and produced, I think six feature films and shot and edited a couple more. Um, but I used to write for what we had. So like if I had a cemetery and a hospital and a shotgun and, <laughs> you know, I would take all the elements that I had available because I knew I didn't have to pay for them. And then I would, you know, find ways to make a story out of that. Um, nowadays I tell stories that I want to tell, you know, that uh, maybe I wake up and had a dream that scared me so much that I think, okay, this would scare people to so make a good horror movie. And, uh, that becomes kind of the seed idea. Um, but what I found to be the best way in terms of process, because uh, my wife, Liz, is uh, also a screenwriter. Um, we have a wall in our house that we take a piece of chalk and we'll do a timeline. And basically, we'll, we'll break this story down into three-part structure. So, you know, we have we'll hit marks. So it'll be like, 15 minutes in and that's when the conflict hits you know and uh take it all the way to the climax and the resolution and um <clears throat> then we build from there i also uh i take post-it notes and i will i will put them into the timeline and if i need to move something i will um but generally i I know like Greg, I'm a fast writer, so I, I know what I want to write. And um, I've written feature, like I wrote Attack of the Killer Shrews in 24 hours, you know, when we lost funding for something else. And it was like 80 pages. And then um, I actually just wrote a, uh, it's a pitch deck, but it's got a full treatment in it. Maybe a little too long of a treatment. <laughs> it was a stream of consciousness kind of thing. And I, I wanted to put all the di like dialogue and little bits and stuff for me. Like Greg was saying, when it's a shooting script and you're going to direct it, it's a little different. You know, you could put in the, the camera movement and some direction and stuff like that. Because um, you don't want to forget it, you know. Um, <clears throat> but I, I did that in a day, you know. So same thing. Like, I'll, I'll sit there and I, I just from beginning to end, I'll, I'll, I'll write the whole thing and drink 10 cups of coffee. And, uh, you know, writing is something that I definitely right now, um, I'm finding a lot of joy in it's very creative. Cheers, Greg. Um, I, <clears throat> I, I manage a company. I manage white lion studios is our uh, production company. And so we have partners and, you know, we have a lot of other things that we do and currently I'm producing my ass off. Uh, but uh, writing is where I find, that I can be creative that I, like Greg said, nobody, nobody's looking over your shoulder and, you know, pushing you around and you could be free. So um, it's, it's really, for me, it's all about creating the writing atmosphere, the environment and carving out the time so that it's not a chore so that it's, it's, you know, it just comes out of you. What would you say, Ken, is the first step once you lock your script, like you have the draft that you love, and you're really ready to start getting things done. I'm usually doing that before I lock the script, um, just because it, we live in kind of a weird world that, uh, like, we had just talked a little bit about, like how everything got started and stuff. And you know, when you when you grow organically like that, you're not very formulaic, right? So um, <clears throat> I will have in mind like let's say Bill Kennedy, you know, I'm the CEO, he's the president, we are a creative team, he's a great actor, you know, he's starring in Guns of Eden, Greg's movie that, that he's about to make. And um, I'll have him in mind for a lead, you know, so I'm writing and I already got him cast and I already got the location set. And, you know, so when I when I have the, the draft the way I want it, um, that's when I start putting together my core team within White Lion Studios um, we'll have a production meeting 
if you could call it that. It's more just like a workshop and, you know, I'll get everybody's feedback. Sometimes we'll do a read through. Um, again, it depends on the project, but uh, if we're going to go full force into a production on something, then you have to be prepared before everything. You know, there's really no excuse to be filming a movie and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't have what I needed for this day or, you know, this location dropped out and we don't have a backup or, you know, so proper preparation is everything. And um, so I don't wait for the script to be locked, but once it is, I mean, I don't know, like Greg probably uses it. Um, I don't use it anymore, but movie magic scheduling is a good software that uh, you break down every single element, all your characters, all your props, everything wardrobe everything and um you know so I, I i do the science of it you know like i'll break down all my pages pages in the eighths and you know i'll have everything ready to go this way uh, i if somebody makes a mistake or something um i know that i gave them you know the the uh formula for success and then something happened and it helps me to uh oversee things a lot smoother in production Rachel, would you say that you're very similar in that aspect, like you're planning things during the writing process, or do you wait until you have a final draft and then you kind of work from there? Yeah, exactly. I would say um, exactly what Kim was saying for both projects, G.O.D. and my own project um, titled right now She Wolf. Um, definitely as we were writing, I mean, my brother had his his script locked you know before coming to buffalo to shoot it but with rewrites came you know you know making sure we had the location making sure that you know we had the crew that was coming on so that definitely i would say is my like similar path especially with my short film she wolf too we did the same thing so um yes i would i would agree for sure yeah greg same with you um the first thing I do after I lock a script is I do use Movie Magic Scheduler. I do my own breakdowns, even, even if I can afford to hire an assistant director. I do my own breakdowns because as a producer, it forces me to know every element that's in that script backwards and forward. And then after I do that, I rewrite the script again. And rather than change all my scene numbers and Movie Magic, I do the breakdown again. I, the, the rewriting just goes on and on for me. It's, I can't. If I have the time, I can't not uh, continue to rewrite, even if it's just changing periods and commas and scenes go out and come back in and go out and come back in. But uh, uh, in terms of pre-production, my producing partner is, is my wife. And even when we have a decent budget, like my previous two films both had $250,000 budgets, which sounds like a lot, but as soon as you hire a full crew, that money just goes right out the window, even if they're working at the friend's rate. Uh, there's never enough money. There's never enough time. But one of the ways that we stretch the dollar is for the first two months of pre-production, she and I do everything ourselves. So literally we get up in the morning, go to our computer, don't leave except to eat meals and work at the computer until we're ready to collapse. Then you get into the final two weeks where you can bring other people in and, and the workload seems to lighten, but then you've got more responsibilities. Um, so yeah, ne never enough money, never enough time. Um, now I have three and a half months to get my next one going. And uh, there's 53 characters in it and all sorts of different wardrobe needs and all sorts of location needs. And it's gonna be very interesting to see how we pull everything together in this situation that we're living in right now. On the topic of funding, because we just talked about how money, there's never enough money. What is your usual process, Greg, for funding your films? Uh, again, it's it's different all the time. I've, I've done films that were strictly investor financed. I've done films that were a combination of investors and crowdfunding, uh, which has been the case with most of them. And right now I'm trying to do one that's strictly crowdfunding. And, and the reason for that is um, I've dealt with, you know, eight films of my own plus the ones I've produced and other ones I've worked on. I've worked with a lot of sales agents and distributors over the years. And I know what the return is to investors on these things. And unless you qualify for the, the tax credit, 
which is hard now because there's a $250,000 spend threshold. My two $250,000 films wouldn't have met the criteria because you have to spend that whole 250,000 in New York state. Because of that, I'm uh, reluctant to go to an investor and say, this is why you should do this film because there's some ethics involved. You know what the, the reality of the business is out there. And if they're not getting that tax credit money, it's really tough. Having said that, now we have section 168, which I'm gonna look into, which is part of the stimulus package. And that does um, allow investors to write off their full 100% investment the first year a film is distributed. That suddenly opens up a whole new doorway. And I, I know that my next film will in some way be tied to the section 168 process. Um, but the devil is always in the details. And it may just be that section 168 apply, does not apply to passive income. So somebody who has a fortune but doesn't have income coming in, it may not help them at all. So th those are the details that I'm, I'm gonna be looking into very soon. This will probably be the first time that I've started planning the next film while I'm going into a different film. Because I would like to get back to a larger scale film where I can afford to hire everybody you know, that I use. So in terms of online platforms that you've used before, Greg, um, which ones would you recommend? Which ones would you not recommend for crowdfunding? Um, you'll have to shut me up if I go on too long here. Just wave your hand. Uh, I've tried Kickstarter and it didn't work. I've tried Indiegogo with their um, flexible Ooh. spending campaign, which allows you to keep your money even if you don't hit your target goal. And as, as I said you know, before the show, I've seen somebody have very good success on uh, Seed and Spark, a lower scale platform that still has 80% success rate, largely because um, the team that runs the platform works with the filmmakers and teaches them how to promote and do the process. And uh, it's been very interesting to watch the actress who's gonna star in my next film run her campaign for her film that she's shooting right after mine. And what I, what I see in Seed and Spark is that um, it seems to be very geared towards uh, progressive filmmakers, towards female uh, filmmakers, towards minority filmmakers. And Rachel, if you aren't familiar with Seed and Spark, I would look into that right away for your next project because the time <laughs> is right for you. Um, one, one of the things I've learned on Indiegogo is that uh, number one, you should have a full team of people two or three friends isn't going to do it. A full team of people, one person can concentrate on Instagram, one person can do Twitter, and everyone has different friends and bases they can appeal to. The other thing is that I don't know what the, the duration limit is on Kickstarter. It's been a long time since I've looked, but on Indiegogo, it's 60 days, and 60 days is too long for a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, most people do a month, and I have read that 18 days or less are the most successful. In my case, I knew I couldn't do what I, what I wanted to do on this film in 18 days, so I went with 28 days. But the other thing that Indiegogo offers is a one-time extension. So I knew that if I didn't hit my goal, and I didn't, in that first 28 days, I could trigger a second 28 days. I could have, gone, I could have used up the full 60. You get a bank of 60 days. But I, I didn't want to do that because I know how tired people get of campaigns if they have that long a stretch and... Uh, they're tired of my campaign anyways, but I tried to get it done in 28 days. I couldn't. I extended it 28 days. I met my goal. I've exceeded the goal. And now what happens that Indiegogo offers that Kickstarter does not is if you're fully funded, you go what's in, called the in-demand program, meaning your campaign stays live and active. Now, I'm telling people that my campaign's ending. It is, but it's live. And I know that when I shoot the film, with 53 rolls, a lot of people are gonna be taking pictures and sharing them, and I'm just gonna make sure that everyone, every photo that gets shared is tied to a link to that campaign, and I'm confident that I'll get post-production money that way. So I, I'm a big believer in Indiegogo right now, although I think Seed and Spark is really worth looking into. Awesome, thank you, Greg. Rachel, you worked on a short recently, and you also worked on a feature. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the funding yeah. process for each of those and how it might have been similar and different? 
Absolutely. Um, I, what I wanted to mention as I was listening to Greg, you know, that's, that's awesome just to hear about his experience with Indiegogo and that great idea to tie the picture to the link. That's just, that's genius, right? So um, that's awesome. But for, for the feature and for the short film, you know, it was a bit different. Um, sponsorships really made GOD, I want to say. Um, sponsorships between different community members. We had a local radio show sponsor us and that caused like publicity. So people started to, you know, hear about the screening, the premiere, and that brought in more funds, funds to back up the post-production that was still left. Um, so that was one major thing that I learned. It's just, you know, the community really can give you and give the people the incentive they need in order to learn how to fund the movie or learn how to be a part of it in order to help at a, a larger event or extent. So um, that was really helpful um, to learn that. But for, for my short film, it was a bit different. It was more uh, self-funded, again, like I said, but it was figuring out how do we make our crew happy where it's the value that they feel like they want to be a part of and where they think that, you know, something will come out of it at the end of the day, whether through a film festival or through, you know, a, a private screening for friends that were a part of it and crew that were a part of it. Um, I think that goes beyond money sometimes when you don't or you're just learning how to fund certain things. Um, so it's getting people involved and also, you know, letting people know that they matter. They're a part of something that's going to be really good. It's going to have a high production value. And that applied to both GOD and she -Wolf. So making sure people knew, like, you're being involved in something really good here, a good script, um, a great crew. And um, we're hoping for future projects that we can get more sponsors through our connections. We can build a greater community where people say, you know, I know about these filmmakers and yeah, I'll check out their Indiegogo. I'll check out their digital campaign. And you know, going from there, like it, it runs like wildfire once you have a, a good production and good crew, so. Yeah, I love that answer. I think engagement, especially on social media, is such a huge part of it. And that's always difficult to navigate when you're doing a crowdfunding campaign for the first time, at least when I had to do my first one when I was still in college. So this is yeah. all really helpful. Awesome. Ken, how about you? What is your process usually like when you're funding your film? Um, well, it's money. You know, it's all money. So it doesn't really matter where the money comes from <laughs> as long as it's not blood money, as long as it's not illegal. Um, so I, I've gotten a lot of funding for a lot of different projects. And right now I'm getting funding for other people's projects because I'm just so wrapped up with uh, paperwork. <laughs> I could say all good stuff, but there's, there's a lot of like in lab stuff that I'm working on and uh, I can't be the boots on the ground. Um, in production right now so i'm i'm funding various projects but um uh, i mean uh what rachel just said about sponsors is very very smart um especially if you look at commercial rates you know like you fat bob smokehouse in buffalo you know they've they've kicked in some uh substantial funding towards some of our stuff i actually traded them i was like look they they sponsor one of our movies and um I also help out with the NCCC Film Festival, which I think is a really good uh, local film festival that doesn't get enough attention. Um, but I told them, look, if you fund their prizes, then I'll just make you a sponsor in the movie, you know? So they funded all their prizes uh, a couple of years ago and, you know, whatever the next movie I make, I'll just put their logo all in it. And um, like I said, if you look at commercial rates versus a feature film and you look at exposure and you look at audience and, you know, like if a movie makes it, onto a, a substantial platform, um, you know, you can't buy that to be a sponsor. I mean, you can, but around here, you know, if somebody gives you like five grand for that, you know, they'll be happy. Um, and, you know, I don't know how much it costs to shoot a commercial these days, but it used to be like 250 an hour just for a cameraman. Um, but beyond that, I hate crowdfunding. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan, you know, I tip my hat to to Greg to be able to do what he did and it's not easy. Um, but you know, to me, I've, I've always, like, I see people do like GoFundMe for like their medical bills and stuff, you know, and it's like, I, I don't, I, making movies is, is great. And you know, art is my life and everything, but at the same time, like, you know, it, there's people that need more help than, you know, than I need to make my movie, you know what I mean? So, um, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with crowdfunding, but it's just not, not my cup of tea. So 
Uh, I don't have a rich uncle or, you know, anything like that. I come from Niagara Falls poverty and uh, I, now I'm at the level where my name actually has value. My reputation actually has value. Uh, people know that I'm going to finish a movie. Um, like Greg, I also understand the ROI. Uh, I understand the distribution contracts on different levels. And so I'm able to sit with investors and explain to them like, okay, you know, it's going to take a few years on this or, you know, um, Greg was just saying that they bumped up the, uh, the tax incentive. Now the qualification is 250. So that could be detrimental. Uh, definitely. Cause you would be able to just get the, the tax money back and then hand that to your investor and say, you know, here's, here's some ROI. Um, but really, you know, like if you got to go to your dentist or if you got to go to a, you know, a family friend or just somebody that's got money, you know, you're not going to turn it away, but you also have to understand how to trade and barter and, you know, like those right now, because we're in a boom in Buffalo, Niagara, and the industry is like, make no mistake, you know, this is, this is kind of going to be the Hollywood of the East Coast. Um, the easiest way to get involved with no experience is the buy-in. So, you know, if you're a real estate mogul or, um, you know, a, a restaurateur or an entrepreneur that is looking to make a name or, or get some footing in this uh, booming industry in, in Buffalo, Niagara, you can buy in as a producer. And that's kind of where I'm at with uh, getting funding on things right now. Oh, awesome. Um, so once you have the funds and you're ready to bring on a crew, who are the first positions you bring on and how do you go about bringing on a team of people? Let's start with Rachel. Yeah, uh, I was thinking about that. And from what I've learned and observed through, you know, working on feature films, I've seen a lot of people who are the writers, either already the directors, or, you know, they work consecutively as one. Uh, my brother, for instance, he was both writer and director for G.O.D. Um, and then what I'll see is maybe the production designer, but mo most importantly, I would say the DP, director of photography, obviously you want to have a close connection with someone who can, uh, you know, visualize what you've written and how you want to direct it. Um, so aside from the DP, the director, the production designer is really important. It was very important for GOD, making sure that, you know, someone could build this world that we had seen for so long, for up, in, up, up to a year, I believe, we had been working on the script. So having someone that could do that was important for us on that film. Um, and I don't know how these gentlemen would um, speak to that experience, but I'll let them share too, so. <laughs> yeah, Greg? Um, DP always, often a star is really important to me. Who's, like, who's gonna be that lead character? Sometimes I know going in that it's gonna be a friend maybe or somebody I've worked with. Uh, on Widow's Point, I hired Craig Sheffer three weeks before shooting. Uh, we were friends, so I was able to pull that off. Production designers are very important. Um, I don't work, I have never had the um, ability to work with the same director of photography over and over. I know some directors who do that. I've, I've had DPs eye on me, I've had people move. Uh, Matt Nardone from NDS is the first person that I've worked on two projects consecutively with. On the one I'm doing this summer, it's an action film and I'm friends with Chris Cosgrave, who does a lot of visual effects for me. And I've seen things he's shot. He's a stay-at-home father like myself. So he doesn't, he's not able to shoot feature films generally. But I knew he was the right person for an action film, just from what I've seen him do with his camera work and his visual effects. So my, it's a given that my wife is part of my team because I need somebody helping me. And it's useful if it's somebody who's with you 15 hours a day conscious so that you're constantly working during that time. But the DP is the next person and I brought him in very early. And uh, you know, every, everyone else falls into place. I, I noticed that sound tends to be one of the last positions. And when I've been hired to, to UPM or, or run a show for somebody else, there's always that scramble for a sound person because they get booked on commercials far in advance. So it's nice to know you have a sound person set up as well. Ken, how about you? Do you first bring in more creative positions or more like logistical positions, like an assistant director? What's your process like? 
Yeah, so um, like they just said, you know, mostly above the line. Um, definitely the creative team, but uh, White Lion Studios is eight of us. So <clears throat> my wife and I were creative partners. We co-run uh, Western New York Costumes and Props, which we launched uh, last year during the pandemic. And um, so she's a seamstress and I build costumes and stuff. And, you know, so we bounce stuff off each other all the time. Like I said, she's a screenwriter. Uh, she's definitely my creative partner. Um, and then Baird Hagman is also part of White Lion Studios. He's kind of the uh, premier go-to guy for uh, vehicles and, and modifications and some stunts in uh, Buffalo, Niagara. Uh, he's out in West Seneca. If I need any sets built or you know whatever he has access to uh vehicles stuff like that um he wants to uh go more towards production design so you know i'm kind of feeding him whatever i can i i, I don't can't remember if he did johnny gruesome as production design or if he was just on the team art director or something right well, he was on for vehicles and he did a lot of the creative stuff with those vehicles there were a lot of vehicle responsibilities on that yeah. and because a lot of the cars that he <laughs> If us didn't work, he would have to bring them in on the big truck and delivering them. So just coordinating all that activity was yeah. a lot. Yeah, that's typical of him. We're jumping cars all the time. Uh, so, you know, he's definitely somebody that I, I bring in in a big way. Um, Bill Kennedy, you know, basically everybody inside my company that can get all the big things done. I don't have a, a I'm the DP, you know, I'm kind of like Addison. I'm a triple threat writer, director, producer, but I've also shot four or five feature films and edited them. So, you know, but I don't consider myself a DP. I just, you know, I didn't want to pay somebody cause I didn't have the money. So, um, you know, like my next movie, I will definitely lock in my DP first because uh, the look of the film is just monumental. And um, I had mentioned the Coleman brothers earlier to you, Greg. Um, they're very, very talented in terms of camera. Uh, they're out of Rochester. So I, I kind of want them to just be uh, our, under our umbrella as our camera team, you know, for forever. <laughs> they have uh, uh, their own truck and, and all their G&E stuff and they're very uh, knowledgeable and everything. So I like to work with people that I can create with, not somebody that's just going to show up and, you know, as a technician and point, click, shoot, you know, I want somebody who's going to tell the story and understand the vision. And um, yeah, so definitely those, those key people on that and the rest just kind of fall into place. Cool. So Greg, I know you were talking earlier about how when you're writing, you sometimes write for a specific person that you know to play the lead character. Our next question is how do you go about casting your film? And it's kind of a loaded question for the second part. Do you usually work with SAG, the actors union? Um, so I've done two features at the $250,000 level that were both SAG ULB. Um, I would like to have budgets big enough to uh, do a full SAG shoot because that would mean I had a bigger budget all around to pay everybody what they're worth and to shoot a longer schedule. On uh, my last film, I will say that, uh, and, and another reason that I like to do, I like the ULB contract, which allows you to mix SAG actors with non-union actors, is that way I can use my repertory of local actors that I try to work with on every film. I can work with some of the, the other SAG people like Josie DiVincenzo and Bob Rush and people like that, usually in just, you know, bit parts, two or three day roles, but I, I like to work with that level of talent. And then you can bring in a few names. But I will say that working with SAG as a, as a low budget producer is an enormous pain in the ass. Your entire pre-production is built around meeting SAG's needs. And it shouldn't be that way. And uh, on Widow's Point, my last film, I said I cast Craig Sheffer. You, when you cast uh, SAG actors, there's a process where they have to approve the actor and make sure they're paid up on their dues before they'll accept them. They're telling you who you can cast and who you can't. And in this case, um, I had Craig coming out on a Saturday to start shooting a movie on a Monday. And by 5 p.m. Friday, he still hadn't been cleared. And in fact, wasn't cleared until 10 o'clock at night. Now you can just imagine the amount of stress that that causes. To Greg Lamberson and Tamar Lamberson, who are trying to work everything around this actor's schedule, who's a pay or play actor on top of that. You have to tell yourself in the back of the head, this is gonna work itself out. 
and, and not jump out the window. But I just find them extremely difficult on these ultra low budget films because they're getting so little money out of the actors' paychecks that they don't care about you. You are the last thing they care about and meeting your needs and your deadlines is the last thing they care about. And, uh, you know, I, after I did these two films at the 250 level, I never thought I would be doing a feature at the level that I'm, I'm doing going into this one. Uh, but between COVID and the tax credit no longer being a benefit, uh, this is the level I'm going at. And I have to say it's an enormous relief to me and my wife knowing that we're not going to be going through the SAG nonsense again. And we can just worry about the creative stuff and not every little piece of paperwork that we have to get them just to do our thing. Ken, have you had to work with SAG before and what's your casting process like? Uh, yeah, I have had to work with SAG, not on my movies, but on a lot of other movies that I've worked on in production, uh, you know, and um, there's, um, I'm kind of, I'm a guerrilla filmmaker. So, you know, like I'm, I'm not like a model for, you know, like what people should do or anything like that. Um, but, uh, like exhibit G forms and, you know, like he's saying all the in the chair, out of the chair, you know, like that. And, and it's cool. You know, you have a second AD to take care of all that stuff, but when you're making a ultra low budget movie and, um, and I'm sure, you know, Greg can attest to sometimes you have to push and sometimes you have to, uh, go a little bit longer and you have to do whatever you have to do. And, um, you know, there's strict rules that, uh, I, the reason I haven't, I haven't really needed a SAG actor on any of the micro budget films that I've made. Um, you know, we flirted with FICOR, which is it's SAG, but they can, they can like go back and forth from a, a union film to a non-union film if they want. And I think that in, in Buffalo Niagara, if I was, um, if I was going to join the union, I would become FICOR because you'd be making a lot more money that way. Um, but uh, I don't like to be muscled by anybody. And uh, I, I'm an artist. I just want to focus on my, on my craft. Um, it's not to say that I, I won't be hiring SAG in the future. Uh, of course I will. Um, but when you get into to unions and the politics and uh, you know, all of that, um, it's, it's, it's a pretty ugly road that uh, if you're somebody like us where, you know, like I, I'm just a little tiny blip on the fringe, you know what I mean? Like I exist and, and we've expanded the film industry out this way, but uh, it's been nice to, to be in this uncharted territory and, and be able to, um, you know, have the freedom to not have somebody looking over your shoulder every five seconds and, um, and a, a lot of SAG actors suck too. So it's like, you know, it's not it's just because they're SAG doesn't mean they're great, you know? Um, and I, I, Greg could tell you, I kind of have a tumultuous history with, uh, celebrities <laughs> and actors. And, uh, you know, so I don't, I, 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 I'm, I'm not a huge fan, I'll be honest. And it's a, another necessity that comes with the monopoly that comes with the Gestapo of the film industry being big business. And it's all about money. But if you want that quality, that caliber, you need it. Um, at the same time, to finish my thought, I like hiring local. I like to give people their break. I like to give people a chance that they won't get anywhere else. I think that's so important. And that's a big part of us staying here. Um, you know, a big part of us being in, in Western New York and trying to discover new talent. So, you know, I would rather pick somebody who's got acting chops that has done some stuff locally than just to put a name in the movie. But devil's advocate when you're selling the movie you need a name yeah rachel with your short film what was your casting process like uh well um it was quite different from the feature film there were no sag actors in it um i think we did just cast mostly locally um local actors here uh, but myself and my co-writer, we were both acting in it, and we are not SAG currently. We're SAG eligible, but I think that just that freedom to work outside the union um, and also to hire those folks outside the union, too, is really awesome. I mean, because, you know, you're not strapped to what they require a lot of the time, and um, 
it, it's really interesting working on a feature length film, having SAG involved. Um, I would say if, if you can't afford it, having a UPM, obviously they, they helped handle a lot of our paperwork with SAG. Uh, Matt Cappuccino was our UPM for GOD and like he just went in for it. I mean, like <laughs> the amount of times that we had to, you know, ask for information from actors or resend information. I mean, like that was his job. So he handled that. But um, thankfully he was a godsend and he knew the ins and outs of SAG. So being a director and writer himself. So yeah, that's one thing I would add in is just if you can have a UPM come on board with you to help, that is excellent. So well, that's great advice. Um, yeah. And Rachel, same, I'm going to stay on you for this question. Um, and this could relate probably more to the feature film than to the short film. How do you collaborate with the Buffalo Niagara Film Commission that we talked about a little bit earlier to make the movie happen? Because like sometimes you got to close the street down, you got to get a permit to film somewhere. So anything that you needed them for? What was your experience like? Uh, it was awesome. As uh, Greg and, and, and Ken were talking about, I'm not sure if before we started, but Tim Clark, obviously, just an amazing asset to have to our city. Like if, if you get in with Tim and you can like really like share your vision with him and say, you know, this, we want to make this happen. He'll do the best he can to do make it happen. I've been on so many short or films that, you know, we've had to shut down streets, but you'll see Tim Clark around. You'll see making, making sure things are kind of in order and like, things are moving along. So um, yeah, just I think having communication with someone like Tim and, and being very detail oriented and how you wanna do something, when you wanna do it, the time frame, how many extras are gonna be around, all of those things matter um, to making sure you can get what you need. For us, we, we didn't need too many permits, but we did need you know access to the central terminal. That was one of our things for, for the feature film. Um, and then also just making sure that, you know, there, our dates worked for the, the Western New York area to shoot the film. Um, we were also in Niagara Falls. So um, just making sure those connections were, were made, I think, is what was really important for us. Great. Greg, how about you? Um, well, I love Tim and Rich, and I've done enough movies here where I've worked with them that I am able to look at the whole picture, which is these guys job is to bring jobs to the area first and foremost that's what they're there for they will help the local filmmakers when they can um but i know i to reach out to them months in advance so they know i'm coming and to keep giving them reminders uh, they're enormous they're both enormously helpful to me but i understand that i am very low on the list of priorities Whereas if we're between big films, I become a bigger <laughs> priority and they're, and they're able to get back to me faster and be more accommodating. So it's really about giving myself enough time. I, I, I laugh at how many times I, I usually have to call Tim before he gets back to me, but he does get back to me and he always comes through for me, always. Um, for Widow's Point, most of my film was set in a lighthouse and I had a hard time getting the lighthouse and I really had to... I really had to ride him to come through for me and work with the location people. Because what, what happened was um, I used a location release that filmmakers who come to town frequently um, to make lifetime type movies use. I mean, it's a vetted uh, legal contract. And uh, the people who ran the lighthouse I shot at, at looked at it and said, wow, this is a lot of legalese. So they gave it to a, a local lawyer who knows nothing about entertainment, who ask for ridiculous things, things that would have made it impossible to um, release my film if I missed one little dot. And it became a nightmare situation, whereas a week before filming, I didn't have this location locked in. And Frank Coppola was my production designer that way. He's like, where, where am I shooting? What am I doing? And it was really tough. And, and Tim worked it out for me. And it came down to uh, politics, basically, being nice, communicating with each other, meeting in the middle. Um, but he had to get involved in a way that I don't think he was planning to. Uh, for the one coming up, I need a lot of locations. I'm gonna shoot at state parks, I know. And a lot of woodsy locations. I'm letting them know I'm in touch with both of them. And that's really the most important thing because I know there's gonna be films coming this summer and it's gonna be very hard for them to show me certain locations. So as soon as my crowdfunding campaign's done this time, 
right into location scouting as soon as they have availability because I need them. Yeah. Ken, have you collaborated with Tim and Rich before at the Buffalo Niagara Film Commission? Uh, oh, yeah. So, uh, so I kind of come at this from a different direction. Um, and I have a different relationship with them than anybody here, probably, probably most people that are even in this area. Just being in Niagara Falls and um, just to, you have to know a little bit about what I do. I'm, I'm not in politics, but I'm kind of a political insider um, because as CEO, my partner, Bill Kennedy as president is a city councilman. He's currently running for a county legislator. And um, so that, that changes the dynamics a lot. And it also, like, if I, if I say something wrong here, it'll wind up in a tabloid tomorrow. So I also have to be, you know, conscious of every word that I say. Um, but we actually met with Tim and Rich last Wednesday and it was not a very good meeting. I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm independent so I can, I can say what I need to say. And, you know, I'm also professional to an extent, but, uh, we had met with, um, we had met with Tim, Bill and I in October and that meeting was to discuss, um, expanding and building the Niagara Falls film industry, you know, cause Greg will tell you, I always say it's the Buffalo Niagara film industry. And, um, and Tim was, was real cool in that meeting. He was like, guys, I got to tell you, you're the pioneers of the Niagara Falls film industry. I'll go on record. I don't care. You know, you're the only ones there. You've done it. And, uh, we, we had this great meeting talking about ideas, um, to let slip a little insider info. They're talking about building a studio here and there's another building that's going to have a sound stage in it. So like there's, there's stuff coming here. Um, the issue, and it's not so much an issue with us as it is with Niagara Falls, uh, Niagara Falls has its own politics. So we have our own political atmosphere. Um, you know, we're sitting next to one of the wonders of the world and we power half the East coast and there's a lot of money, you know, there's billions of dollars and there's also a lot of corruption, which we're kind of famous for. So, um, they obviously don't want to get involved with any of that stuff. They don't, they don't want to, you know, get their hands dirty and I don't blame them. And, you know, we've, we fought for the grassroots. We fought for the little guy for so long. And so they've had a lot of trouble and Tim and myself have been having this ongoing conversation now for 10 years, <laughs> you know, we'll meet like once every couple of years for coffee or whatever. And, um, Niagara Falls doesn't receive the benefits that uh, the city of Buffalo does from productions. That's just a fact, you know, and a lot of people could say, well, it's because of the architecture. It's because it's a, a metropolitan area. And those things are true, but we also have locations and we also, you know, have locations around us and we have services and goods and stuff. Um, but what we have seen over the past decade or so are movies come into the state park, filming at the state park and then leaving. And, if you film at the state park, Delaware North has an exclusivity contract there for catering. So we can't cater those movies. Um, you know, I'm not dissing Angela Birdie or anybody like that. You know, it's her job to get movies through and that's great. But um, getting them into the city has always been our concern. And I've had to act as like a, a liaison, just like uh, Rachel, you know, for GOD to get that at the police station, you know, Kennedy, asked me like what I think about that and you know it's like yeah bring them in you know let them film here do what they need to do if they need the church because there's a bathroom in the church get the church you know like do what you have to do to get them here um and we have all these great locations and, and, and local people that will work for free or for low budget and um you know so we have a lot going for us but when we met with with them last Wednesday uh you know Tim being the consummate professionally is you know he he was great uh for the most part but Rich kind of I don't know if, yeah, if he was having a bad day or what, but, you know, I, I had said to him like, Hey, you know, you only got seven locations listed on, on the website for Niagara Falls. And he, I was like, we have a lot of other locations. And he's like, Oh, here we go again. Ken and his mystery locations. You know, it's like, they're not mystery locations. We have a lot of good locations here, you know? And um, you know, it's, it, it's been like beating our head against the wall. And like Greg was saying, we hadn't heard from him since October. So it took six months to get in touch with him. So I understand they're, you know, they're working with Paramount and other studios right now, and that's their main job. So us, us local little guys, 
like in that meeting, Rich told me, he's like, Ken, you've never asked us for anything. You've never called, you've never needed anything. I'm like, yeah, I'm independent. You know, I shoot Niagara Falls. We've groomed locations since 2008 when I made my first feature film. You know, there's, there's businesses that know us that we know the power capabilities. We know the parking, you know, like we know everything. And uh, so when I shoot here, we can get our own permits. Um, when we do stuff that's more gorilla, like I know they got really mad at us when we did the car flip for killer shrews, uh, which, you know, everybody got mad, but we flipped a car. It was Baird driving the car. It was Baird's car and he flipped it on his property. And you know, he, if you want to flip a car on your property, you could do that. He's not sag. You have to be sag to flip a car, you know, like it, it's all politics. So, um, you know, we, we've had, uh, we've had our clashes in the past and I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that maybe the film office will see this. Maybe Tim and Rich will see this because they were at that meeting last week and uh, maybe they'll go, okay, you know, we need to work with those guys and not try to sidestep them, you know, because they recognized us, but then they have their vision of what, you know, they're doing to build uh, this infrastructure and create it. And I'm a big firm believer in like, just, you know, give recognition where it, it, it's due to those who, you know, did something before you like Greg's been making movies longer than I've been alive, you know? So like, I respect that. And so, you know, but the, there's, you don't need the film office to make a movie. You don't, you know, you don't need their permission to make a movie. Um, if you need a permit in Buffalo, if you need to do your tax docs. Yeah. But uh, you know, j just Greg nailed it when he said their entire existence is to bring jobs and bring money and uh and and they've never done like i got i got a job from battle dogs i won't lie and i got you know i got gripped on american side and i've i've gotten gigs that you know they brought into town but i haven't worked on anyone else's movies since uh in, as a crew since greg when was uh christmas in vermont 2016 like january 2016 i don't even want to think about how long ago <laughs> yeah that was the last time and and you know God bless them for what they're doing, but um, they seem they see us as competition, and it's not right. You know, it's it, it, we're just independent artists, and um, they're not even they shouldn't even be in this game. They're not a production company, they're not filmmakers, and you know they don't want to talk like they're politicians. They always say we're not politicians, but they kind of are politicians. And uh, so I would caution any indie filmmaker to keep them at an arm's length. Let them do your paperwork and stuff, or get you what you need, but don't um, don't count on them. Uh, I don't want to debate anything Ken <laughs> said. Go ahead. I just want, I've had very positive uh, dealings with him. I just wanted to follow up on one thing that I said. Um, I play a lot of phone tag with Tim, but I do want to make the point that Rich is always very accessible. I've always been able to get hold of him. Um, so no issues uh, from me on, on that score. Uh, I do think they are, they're important, um, but the work they're doing, you know, bringing movies like A Quiet Place 2 and Wolf Boy and things like that into town, that's, that is the, the reason for them to be here. And uh, I'm, I know that when I get up against the wall, I'll be able to get hold of them and they'll be able to help me, even if I have to wait for things to calm down on a big show that's in town. So uh, I wouldn't recommend this. Uh, dismissing them out of hand but a lot of things Ken said are true you don't need the film commission to make an independent film and you can get your own locations and, and so on and so on um if I need a lighthouse it's a different story uh, this movie I'm shooting this summer it's in woods all over I'm going to be in Niagara Falls Ken you know that I'm going to be in Buffalo I'm going to be in Niagara Falls I'm going to be Chautauqua County I'm shooting all over because I want unique woods so it doesn't look like the same trees over and over and you know i know that they will hook me up um and angela uh, betty's with certain park areas that i already know that i want so to each their own everybody's got to find their own way and, and work out their own relationships um i i think they're very important to the area yeah certainly and you know if uh if i wasn't tried and true niagara community activist and you know involved in my community heavily um you know like i'll give you an example and, and i'm not here to bash but you know the ncc film festival that i mentioned it's been ongoing since like the 90s and you know they haven't 
ever actually physically been present there that I'm aware of, you know, so it would be great to see them come and, you know, like present an award or, you know, give a speech or something like that, just because uh, it's in Niagara County, you know? Uh, okay, by the way, go ahead. Uh, Ken, you had mentioned uh, Pat Kaufman early on, and I want to second how important she, yeah. she is. And she was Tim and Rich's boss for a while, and they had a close relationship with her. And she's not quite an unsung hero because we did bring her out for Buffalo Dreams you to did. give her a special award, and, and they they were able to arrange that. You um, did. Thank you for that, yeah. I mean, I, I work with them, and I used to work with them in terms of the festival as well as other stuff. Not, not they're far, far away from, from the festival because they're too busy with all the productions, which is where they need to, to be focused. Yeah. Yeah, Pat, Pat's a rock star. And I, I will say that your festival is the best festival in this region. I've played in, I think, every film festival in this region, but you actually care about the filmmakers. You actually care about the quality of the presentation. Um, you know, you put a lot of work into the programming. And when you had Pat come, I thought that that was really, really awesome because, you know, she's, she's always behind the scenes. So for you to actually, you know, recognize her, that's what we need more of. So we've been, we've been talking a lot about pre-production. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just want to check in with you. I mean, it, your job might not change, but the question is how does your job change when you transition from pre-production to actually shooting on location, on set, wherever you may be filming? Let's start with Rachel. Yeah, well, for me, I was a co-producer on G.O.D. So it was quite, quite different once we were actually on set. It was just hellacious, to say the least. Um, a hell of a day every single day. Um, not only was I co-producing, but I was doing background casting. So it was immediately boots on the ground every day. Um, there might be one or two people on here today that was part of G.O.D. production. And they'll tell you, too, it was just a constant movement. Um, no time to really breathe. Even during lunch, you know, being a co-producer was making sure we were on track for the next day. You know, who do we have to contact today? Um, do we need to make sure this venue is all right, this location set? Um, so it, it it's a change of speed for sure. It's um, a lot more phone calls um, and a lot more distractions. So if you have to stay focused, you know, I recommend, you know, making sure you get, like block out time to do that even when you're trying to like, you know, produce a movie throughout the schedule, you know, just save a little time to just write down what needs to be done so you don't lose track of it during the day. Um, and so you can hit all those points if, if you can. Um, I, I couldn't always complete every single task every day um, just because there was so much to be done still. Um, phone calls with extras, phone calls with, you know, um, some of our community liaisons, making sure that they were involved. Um, so that's how it changed for me on a feature film. Um, have heavily, heavily involved. You're, it's an all immersive experience once you step foot on set and you start producing the movie. Greg, would you agree that it kind of picks up once you finish all the planning and then you're actually there on the day shooting the scene? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, a lot of the work continues. Pre, the pre-production continues, unfortunately, through production because 90% of your time seems to be about problem solving. You know, what went wrong? How do I get around, around this? How do I address this? Um, when I did my, my first Buffalo film, Slime City Massacre, which, I mean, it was a $50,000 film, but we had a lot of actors from out of town. We had tons of extras. We had a lot of special effects people, just a lot of logistics, even though we were primarily based at the, the baggage buildings outside the central terminal, not in the terminal itself, but in the really ruined buildings. Um, and my production manager was John Renna, who's in, in, on every film that I do in some capacity. My assistant director was Michael O'Hear. Uh, neither one of them had done the, the jobs before. And I knew that bringing them in, because when you're bringing people, you know, when you're making a movie and you're not paying people, you have to find people who are there to learn and are enthusiastic about getting involved. Um, by the end of the shoot, they both knew what they were doing. But during the shoot, uh, Money was coming out of one of my pockets. Receipts were going in the other. I'm worrying about where lunch is. And it's just a lot of logistics you have to think about as a producer director at the same time that I'm directing. And it's really tough. And uh, on Killer Rack, I had Paul McGinnis and Rod Durick sharing a lot of those responsibilities with me, which was nice. And it was a similar budget. 
Uh, my last two films, um, my wife was really lead producer. Once we got on set, she worried about all the logistics and the catering and this or that and anything that came up, she could handle that. Now we're going into this new film and I don't have the budget for a production manager. I don't have the budget for an assistant director. And because my daughter is immunocompromised, my wife can only work from home. So she'll problem solve how she is at home. But I know that on set, I'm largely gonna be on my own. Um, I got very lucky in dealing with Keith Lukowski on this film. I've known Keith since uh, we were both overage production assistants on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie when it came to town. And he's helped me with some locations here and there. And I just know him as this very uh, outgoing guy. And I offered him a, a role in my new film. And then he slowly got more involved. And then he became an associate producer. And now he's providing me with two 4K cameras, all the gear I can handle, a truck himself, his friend Larry Sanders. And he has sort of, uh, he's going to basically be a production manager for me. He's gonna be a production manager slash assistant director slash grip. That's gonna be his role on the film. Um, the more people I can have so that I'm free to direct, the better, but I'm on a shoot where I, by necessity, need to keep the crew as small as possible. So these are factors that really affect that. But in terms of the difference between pre-production and production, pre-production is about laying the groundwork for what you want to do. And then on the day, you're on. I mean, your cast has to deliver, your crew has to deliver, but as a director, you have to be in a whole different mode and you've got to lead by example and you've got to set the tone and you've got to control the pace. And uh, it's like rehearsing for a play, you know? you know? The rehearsals are great and they're critical, but once you're on the stage, you just gotta deliver one way or the other. And how would you say your job changes from pre-production to? Uh, it's a huge flip. So right now where I'm at, uh, when we were moving, going into 2020, we had a really great trajectory. I mean, nobody could have, anticipated the pandemic um but basically everything is intellectual property right now and so a lot of what i've been doing is stockpiling intellectual property and then 2020 actually in some ways helped us because um it's kind of like a nascar if there's a crash and then the pace car comes out and then all the cars have to slow down behind the pace car so it allows everyone time to catch up um the studios lost control of the film industry because of 2020 and, and that control went to the streamers. It went to Netflix, uh, you know, Disney went to Disney plus and, and Hulu and so on and so forth. So what happened was we started getting contacted by um, streaming services that are like, you know, more fringe, you know, there's still, you can still get them on Roku and stuff, but they're like trying to uh, establish, you know, some kind of dominance and some kind of niche. And uh, you know, they wanted original content and, Lucky for us, we shoot with a skeleton crew, so you know it's it's not too hard to accomplish things with a piece of cheese, you know. And uh, so going into production now is it's a little different, you know, COVID restrictions and all the crap that you know Greg's about to deal with. <laughs> I don't I don't really envy him at all, but um, I I've I've personally been. I guess you could say in charge as first AD over a, a million dollar production, you know, um, down in Florida, the Atlantic room movie I mentioned, uh, you know, we, we shot a scene with 50,000 people in a Mardi Gras parade, you know, and uh, I, I seen shit that you guys wouldn't even believe in terms of production. <laughs> Greg might believe some of it, but uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of bad that can come of, uh, of filmmaking, obviously number one safety is first, you know, like it, nobody should ever be injured um you know and and when you're working in such a high intensity environment and everybody's got their adrenaline going and you know like yeah there's lingo and there's uh precautions and stuff that you can take but it really only takes somebody you know not paying attention full attention for a moment to you know poke somebody's eye out with a c-stand or something like that so um you know so I, i'm i'm I've, I've had it drilled into my head um, because even though I, I'm school of hard knocks, indie filmmaker, I've also been, 
I guess you could say classically trained um, by the same people that Greg and a lot of a lot of everyone else in this area have been by you know Chris Ray and his production company and uh, the Asylum and Fred Olin Ray and um, so I'm I'm acutely aware of production I'm, like everything that needs to happen um, scheduling I'm a, I'm very aware of when a schedule is gonna go wrong <laughs> you know uh, I, I'm able to foresee all of these problems. I don't know how many movies I've worked on now, but it's, it's definitely over 50. And, uh, you know, I, I like to be at home. I like to work from home. I'm taking care of my, my son. He's two. I, um, I, I, I'm a problem solver. So like Greg, when you're in Niagara Falls, you know, like just give me a, a few weeks notice, uh, when you have a date and, uh, you know, I could be on call that day so that, you know, if anything does happen and you're in an emergency situation, you know, we can send support your way or, you know, for whatever you need. That's basically what we've been doing. We've do, we've done it for uh, Discovery Channel in the past two years, we've done it for Travel Channel, um, and then a, a variety of productions that come through. So I, it changes for me because once, either if I'm on set and I'm in production, obviously you're, the show is ongoing and, you know, you're not going to sleep for two weeks. Um, but now that I'm kind of captain of my own ship and our company is lending support to major studios i basically just have to have my phone on and i have to know you know like what's happening on set um and their needs and and you know i i try to anticipate those problems and solutions prior so that if they call me and they say you know our jenny just blew or you know whatever under the sun um i already have everything that they need all ready to go and i already have people if i can't take it out to them i have runners that will just go and give it to them so it really is proper preparation everything is key yeah and once once everything is finished up in terms of filming how do you go about finding distribution or is that something that happens before you even start filming um well yeah if you're lucky uh you know it could happen prior um i mean i think that anyone who's savvy that has done it long enough uh, kind of has an idea. You have to have a distribution plan. I mean, you should present that to your investors right up front. Um, I mean, I've had a movie I did, Wolf House, is a five thousand dollar budget that I pretty much did everything on. Um, that was distributed by a company called Wild Eye, and it got into Walmart. So we were competing for shelf space with like you know the the big budget movies, and um, you know I'm 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 pretty. Uh, pretty well-rounded in, in distro right now. Um, but again, everything's changing now. Everything's going to streaming. DVD is basically a, uh, a relic, you know, it's a keepsake or for collectors. And, um, so, I mean, we made our money back, but right now I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't see DVD being a, uh, a viable way to make your money back, but I mean, you can get your movie on Amazon prime without a distributor. Um, Film festivals back when I was first coming up and, uh, you know, making features, I, I was obsessed with film festivals. I thought, wow, this is, you know, how all the greats did it, you know, and, um, maybe we'll be a festival darling somewhere, but then, you know, politics got it like, you know, Sundance is like impenetrable and then slam dance became impenetrable, <laughs> you know? So it was like the one, the festival that was for the little guy after Sundance pushed everyone out became you know, absorbed into the political machine. So festivals like Greg's festival, you know, the, those, those niche festivals that are well run by filmmakers. Um, that's, that's a great way to display your work. Uh, and the cost of renting the, uh, the theater screen and four walling your movie, um, is sub it's substantially less to uh, submit to a festival and have it play. Um, as far as distribution goes, I'm working with a couple different streaming platforms right now. And, um, I would, I would say, and this is always my, uh, my advice to new filmmakers who are going to end up getting some kind of boutique distributor that for one, you need to have a, what I call a no shelf clause. So companies like Harvey Weinstein's Weinstein company, they they have been notorious in the past for, um, buying the rights to a movie and then shelving it so that nobody could watch it and then remaking it with their, you know, their cast and some celebrities. And, um, and that's just, to me, is just such a nightmare. So uh, you don't want to get caught up in somebody buys 
or, or you know, it licenses your, uh, your distribution rights and then the movie never comes out. <laughs> you know, that's, that's bad. So uh, what I do when I write a contract is uh, the movie has to be distributed within two years of execution of the contract or the contract's null and void. So that means within that time period, they have to, you know, get going. Um, you have to set a cap, a spending cap. I learned that the hard way. Uh, if you don't send a, set a spending cap for a distribution company, what they will do is they will fly on your dime. They will eat lobster at film festivals. They will, you know, get good hotel rooms, everything. And you're paying for it. So uh, you have to set a cap. And a good cap is 14000 and a great cap is 12000 that's all their costs. So printing, artwork, you know, everything. That's all their costs. Once you hit that cap, then the net starts. So now you're making money, you know, and usually it's a 50-50 split if you got a good deal. Um, and then I work things into the contract where if, if you know, it's going to be distributed like uh, Wolf House, um, I want 100 copies of the DVD. You know, I don't want to have to buy copies and I want, I want complimentary copies of my film. So, uh, you know, I'll say hundred copies. Lloyd did it for us for a trauma movie that we did. And, uh, and then every contract should have an exit clause in case you don't like the partner that you're working with. That's just standard. It should be in there, but, um, it's good to have a lawyer. I would say <laughs> first and foremost, get yourself a lawyer. I think that's great advice. Thanks. Um, Rachel, on GOD, did you guys deal with distribution at all? And did you, if you did, did you deal with it before you started filming, after you wrapped? Yeah, well, I, I think that we dealt with it mostly after the fact. Um, one of our investors, um, Lagra Lane, they um, are out there in Los Angeles. Um, they had a lot of connections. So I think that, you know, once the finished product was done and they were able to see, you know, what we accomplished and as an investor, their return on, you know, the value, um, they were able to, you know, then do that groundwork and say, suggest talking to this person or that person. I wasn't too involved and I'm still not very involved with the, the distribution process for that. Um, I think I'm just quite green on my own projects right now, learning about that. But um, yeah, you know, sometimes it helps to have a, a management team or someone who can manage that interaction between the film and the distributor um, and linking in all the different group members. Awesome. Greg? Uh, don't plan on making money. <laughs> if you're getting independent film uh, to make money, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Do it to make the best movie you can. Anybody who has basic releases from talent and, and locations can get distribution. Um, some distributors require more elaborate deliverables that's what the items are called but they're all out there and they all want product and they're all built to screw the filmmaker that's just the way it is um, ken was mentioning the cap no matter how you try and get around the spending cap on expenses the way sales agents and distributors are meant to be is to support themselves based on those expenses that you're trying to cap and they're paying for their salaries, their expenses, the art directors that they hire to do their covers. That's what their expenses are. When they call it marketing, it's not advertising for your film so that people will watch it. They don't care if people see your film. They want to recover just enough to pay those expenses. And then they're on to the next film and they support themselves with that way. And it goes on and on and on. And if the filmmaker sees a few thousand at the end of the day, great. I see uh, first time filmmakers all the time get so excited that they've signed a worldwide distribution deal with a distributor that no one's ever heard of. All that means is that if that distributor has five sales contacts around the country, 5% of the world is covered, that's 95% of the, of the place of the planet where your film isn't going to be represented and isn't going to get distributed. A worldwide distribution is worthless and detrimental unless there's money up front. Um, you know, back in the 80s when the, when the video boom was going, my, my entertainment lawyer that I had back then since retired said, if you don't get that money up front, you're never going to see it. 
and we had to fight for every dollar. And, you know, I've, I've been more fortunate than most in, in that money has come in. And the combination of that little bit of money with a tax credit has offset a lot of the pain of what all these distribution companies end up doing. Um, just don't count on that worldwide distribution paying off. Uh, typically, you, um, while you're in production, if you're generating press, you'll get contacted by sales agents and distributors. Who, they wanna lock you in right away. They don't wanna pay you any money. I, I usually don't even read those emails. I'm so used to them coming in. Uh, always vet the company, you know, check with filmmakers they've distributed, see, see what the deal is. You'll know fast if you're gonna see a couple thousand dollars, $10,000, nothing. Uh, a company like Lionsgate might pay you $10,000 for an, uh, a film, lock you into a 10-year contract and you'll never see another dime. 10,000 may sound good if you've got a film made for under 10,000 or even if you crowdfunded a film. That's 10,000 you may not have been counting on, but that's the most you're gonna see out of a company like Lionsgate, which is a huge company. Um, so you want, if at all possible, you wanna try and get some sort of arrangement where you get something from dollar one or where you keep those uh, capped expenses low, like Ken said, or you don't want to sign with just one distributor. You want an international distributor. You want a domestic distributor. Uh, the last film I worked on was, was Chris Ray's VA33. As far as I know, they have three different distributors handling different rights. Now, that's a film with five name actors, and, and they've already made money, uh, which is a miracle. And, and by the way, that film will be playing theatrically April 2nd. So Paramount picked them up. They're one of the three companies. Lionsgate is another one. Saban, which handles international sales, is another one. Um, so go into it with limited expectations. And any money you can make on your own before signing with somebody that doesn't pay you money up front is wise, whether it's local screenings, a limited edition Blu-ray, that, you know, if, if they have a problem with that, don't tell them. You know, they're going to screw you every which way. You, you screw them. Every dollar you can make for yourself, you should do before you get into bed with these devils. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and, and really like, that's such a good point because the thing is, and, and I'm glad that Greg is on here too, because uh, this is a ruthless industry. You know, if, if yeah. everyone could do it, they would be doing it, you know, cause who doesn't want to make movies? So, you know, like, um, we have our notorious reputations, but it's like, all right, well, this is my livelihood. I haven't had a nine to five job since 2018. Like this is what I do 24 seven. And I have to hustle to be able to make that happen, but I'm not going to get out hustled by some distributor that <laughs> wasn't on my movie, didn't work on my movie, didn't, you know, so, and, and he's right about the numbers too. So, you know, like, I think if you're somebody that can uh, create a relationship, like a real relationship with um, a, a, a streamer right now, th then you're golden, you know, you just have to prove yourself, but it's all streaming. Everything is streaming right now. Yeah. Switching gears a bit, speaking about right now, with ever since the pandemic started with COVID regulations in place, um, I don't know if any of you have actually been filming yet. I know you talked about how you're in pre-production, Greg, for um, the, the project you're crowdfunding right now. So this question is pretty much for anybody that it applies to, how has independent filmmaking changed ever since the pandemic began? Uh, I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, yeah, I did my short last November, so this Thanksgiving that just passed. It makes people a little bit more on edge. I would say a little bit more walking on eggshells, making that, making sure that the set is actually safe. You know, um, we're dealing with like a, a lethal virus here. So when we come to set, we're making sure now, you know, everyone has a face mask on, that our AD is like on top of those things, you know, because it's people's lives that we have in our hands now. It's not just a film project. It's not just imagination anymore, pretend, it's, it's, it's real. So um, definitely has been an experience, you know, there's temperature checks, there's, um, you know, if, if people do need to be tested, people are being tested days prior to. Um, so it becomes just another notch up on the pre-production side of, you know, what needs to be done, what needs to be taken care of once we're actually there on set. So 
it's a bit different and it's a little bit scary at times because you never know how everyone on the crew is actually feeling maybe until like you see a Facebook post or something but I mean it's just being extra precautious now um and that's something I've always been a safety on set you know non-hazardous as much as possible I mean because I'm involved too and I, I'm, I'm in that person's shoe as well so yeah COVID has changed things it's definitely um rearranged a lot of films that I was supposed to work on you know it's canceled a lot of things based on just how do people follow regulations something so new so yeah Greg did you want to speak a little bit about I know you're still in the planning process but uh, I can only relay some second and from secondhand information and, and that's a, a mutual friend of Ken's, Ken's and mine who makes movies all the time and has lately been making movies mostly in LA because traveling just doesn't make sense during this. That's a whole nother headache. But for a 12 day lifetime TV movie to hire a company, basically of five people to meet all the cars as they come into location, give the test, do the rapid tests, which on SAG you have to do. And the any SAG actress, that's what you need the rapid testing. Um, waiting for the results, bringing the people in, then doing the temperature checks uh, for a 12 day shoot adds $90,000 to the budget. $90,000. I'm making my whole movie for less than $90,000. Uh, non union films have, have less strict requirements. Um, for one thing, you don't have to do the rapid testing, but you still have to do testing. You test people a week before shooting and uh, the beginning of every week, say. I mean, you can work out the schedule any way you want, but you have to meet certain requirements. Here in New York State, you can get tested for free. Uh, people will make their appointment, they'll drive, they'll get their tested. Do you ask your people who are working for low or no pay to go on their day off to get tested? No, they have to get tested on a set day. We're only allowed to shoot 10 hours a day now. I typically do 11 hours with an hour to wrap up. I stopped doing 16 hour days when I was 21. I did it on one shoot, that was enough. That's not a possibility now. These films that come to town and make people work 15 hours a day, can't happen. 10 hours a day, that means a longer shooting schedule. Even with fewer people, that's extra food, that's other, you know, you're incurring other costs. So uh, time management is really important. I have not shot anything during the pandemic. Um, I refused for one thing. There weren't a lot of opportunities here, but I refused. Uh, Chris Cosgrave and I did shoot our pitch video um, for our, the project we're funding. Uh, we did it um, basically by bringing out, for the most part, one or two actors at a time and shooting them separately and then coming back another day and shooting that actor separately. And, and that's how we did it very simply. Um, I've seen a lot of photos of people around town shooting micro budget films and short films. And, you know, they're posing next to each other for their selfies with their masks off or somebody without a mask is talking to somebody with a mask, no matter how safe they say they're being, they're not socially distancing. You have to have somebody who's just monitoring that. That's the point of a COVID compliance officer. Now, whether you follow the rules and obey the law and have a COVID compliance officer, or if you just designate somebody on set to keep your people alive, you have responsibilities as a human being to make sure things are not being done the way they normally are, that people understand that uh, you don't have a holding area, that you don't have, you're not eating lunch together, that the parking lot where everybody has their cars, hopefully spaced six feet apart, is where each person's gonna rest when they're not shooting, where they're gonna eat their meals. Uh, it's a lot. And two of the people that I've been talking to locally just trying to wrap my head around it um, are Adam Block, you know, one of our key sound guys who does stuff all the time, and Christopher Schrock, who, who's probably our foremost set medic. And they've both been working regularly on commercials and other shoots. And I know Schrock is in uh, Syracuse on a show right now. And learning from people who have actually been through this is a lot more useful than talking to somebody who thinks they know better, you know. Uh, the information's out there. It's not necessarily disseminated. Reach out to people who know what they're doing, who have been through it. Ken, have you worked on anything since the beginning of the pandemic? Um, no, I, I I was contracted to do a pilot um, 
on a Native American reservation and I shut down production um, because I just wasn't sure about it. You know, I, I, I felt very uneasy, especially being on a reservation where they live with their elders and, you know, it's, I'm not going to be responsible for, you know, somebody dying or something like that. And uh, a lot of people were very upset at me and I lost a lot of money that way, but um, I don't care because like Greg just said, we have responsibility to keep everyone safe. And, um, you know, I, if you're just chasing the almighty dollar, then you're in it for the wrong reasons anyway. But uh, I know a lot of people get blinded by the glamour and everything, but um, it, it was a hard thing. To, it was a hard decision. And I was really, I was really trying to make it work, but there were some scenes that had some crowds and stuff like that. And uh, I just like, you know, if it was just the, the scene with like the kid riding his bike and stuff. Yeah. But I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. Um, I did teach a master class last week where we did a, an exercise where we shot a music video and, uh, it was handled by uh, NCCC, so, you know, they were very on top of all of the, uh, you know, compliances and stuff, but um, that was my first foray onto a set, you know, where everybody's got masks and, you know, six feet apart, because I'm co-producing the Coleman Brothers right now, but I'm not on set, and I know that they have... Uh, limited it down to like just the two brothers <laughs> and like uh an ad and then the cast and um i don't know who their compliance officer is i just trust that they're handling everything you know the way that that they know how to um basically like i was saying before i mean there's been some big changes because of covid and they're not all related to being on set and production um and greg was saying 90 90 grand for a two-week production and i was hearing um from from my partners in LA early on that it was a hundred hundred grand a week for uh, the productions that they were working on and then the studios were suing the insurance companies because it was just basically a way to to bleed the studios and uh, you know again we're getting back into the politics of all of it but that's it's still kind of in entwined in that po political atmosphere and uh so I'm trying to distance myself from it. And kind of like Dr. Dre said, you know, I've been in the lab with the pen and the pad trying to get this label off. Uh, you know, I'm building my brand. And so I found other unique ways to do it that don't involve actual physical production being in production. Right now I'm working with uh, Toronto, LA, Hong Kong, and Australia around the clock. Okay, so I could be, the Hong Kong and Australia are almost the same time table and so you know when it's 9 a.m here it's 9 p.m in hong kong and you know so i have to be up late to communicate with them um and hong kong got hit real bad you know obviously wuhan and, and everything with the virus china still under very strict uh limits um australia my wife and i are contracted on a, a tv series that um i'm building like a bigfoot costume that it's like an australian bigfoot and she's doing the entire wardrobe and um it shot me out back so, you know, there's, you don't have to worry. I, I, I don't think, I don't know how Australian government really feels about COVID, but <laughs> it's Australia. So, they, you know, they, they're kind of just like, Hey, we're out here. It doesn't matter. We're shooting the thing. And um, LA is just a mess. Toronto was shut down for a long time and now they're starting to, to reboot what we're doing. And this kind of goes back to the film office. Once this border opens and I live right next to the, like, I could see it from my house. Once that opens, Toronto's a straight shot. So everybody's thinking Buffalo, but you got to be thinking Toronto because Toronto's going to come right through here. I was going back and forth to Toronto, I don't know, every month um, right before the shutdown. So, you know, I was, I was cruising. Um, you know, I lost a lot of money in 2020, just like everybody else. But I used the opportunity to get into the logistics of it and uh, – all the all the uh, intellectual property and all the content, everything right now, we were able to, to to hang on to it. And I said, well, this works. And when you're doing something that works, you know, like filmmaking, making the movie, being on set, editing it, like that all takes years. I'd rather be able to be like, okay, uh, yep, yep, send me the bill, you know, send me my uh, paycheck, and 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 now I got a credit on a production, and you know, I just sat here on my computer for a week. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's awesome that you can work with so many different places at once, all from the comfort and safety of your own home. So that's really nice. cool. Yeah. Um, 
The last question that I have before we open it up to the Q&A, and we'll start with you, Ken, is what advice do you have for the aspiring filmmaker who's stepping into their first independent feature film? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm known for being kind of brash and abrasive, so, you know, I apologize ahead of time, but uh, I won't, first of all, I won't ever discourage any, any filmmaker from making a movie or from, you know, going into it because uh, my first mentor, Fred Calandrelli, he told me, and he, he produced for Disney a couple of projects and, you know, he told me, uh, you know, right now, I, I think I was 18. He's like, you're, you're setting off to make your first movie and there's a million other people who are doing the same thing. And out of those million people, everybody's telling them, you know, it's not going to happen. It's a dream. And, you know, out of that million, maybe 10,000 of them will ignore them and, and you know, be stubborn. And those 10,000 are the ones who are going to keep going. So you have to be a little crazy, but my biggest critique with what I see with up and coming filmmakers right now is that they, they want so bad the image they, you know, like the Instagram and TikTok, and, you know, they'll make a Facebook page for something that doesn't even exist. It's like they're, they're their brand. And they're like, look at me, I'm a filmmaker. It's like, well, it, Greg will tell you, if you come out the gate and you tell people you're a director, you know, you're going to get shredded because like we earn that title, you know, like you're not a filmmaker until you make a movie. Technically I'm not even a filmmaker cause I never made a film, you know, <laughs> I make movies. So, you know, like it, you have to respect what's already there, what, what, that which has come before you that already exists. You know, it was really nice to hear Rachel say something about that earlier because nobody ever acknowledges that like, you know, in, in 2012, before the boom, there was what, Greg, like seven of us, you know? <laughs> and uh, so it's, 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 and it's not to say like there's any kind of rank or anything. It's just that, hey, there's infrastructure. We built this, you know, we've groomed it and, and, and we're here to help you. We want to build an industry because then we get work too. And, um, you know, so my advice is just to focus on the content and on, on your, your skills and focus on your craft and honing your skills. Because if you want, if you want people to recognize you as an actor or producer or writer, director, filmmaker, whatever, you have to produce, you have to act, you have to do those things. You can't just claim the title and hope that, you know, look at me, you know, and uh, a lot of it's not pretty. Um, Greg said that if you're getting into this for money, then don't get into it. And I back that up a hundred percent. I've been doing it for professionally. I don't know how long, but uh, you know, I, I'm just now starting to have that breakthrough where it's like, okay, I feel comfortable. Um, you know, like it, 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 and it's taken a lot of blood. It's taken a lot of sweat. So uh, it takes a special kind of breed. Don't do it if you're, if you're just doing it to, you know, gain a reputation. There's other things that you could do. But if you love it and you're passionate about it, then pursue it. Awesome. Rachel? Yeah. Yeah, just to reiterate what Ken said, don't be afraid to do the hard work. I don't know if I cut out or not, but don't be afraid to do the hard work. Don't be afraid to write the idea out, to do the screenplay. Um, it'll be a lot of rewrites. There will be a lot of times you want to pull your hair out, you know, but don't, don't be afraid to actually step into the role, like Ken said, and actually embody that. Do the work that's required to sharpen the skills, to write the script. Um, be involved with, with the film industry, you know, if you can. I mean, I started as a, a production assistant. Um, and, you know, I still facilitate in those ways of assisting people. So, you know, just, just learn as much as you can um, and, and work in different avenues, too, in the, in the industry. Um, see what you can learn from all the different opportunities that you can acquire. So put the work in write the rewrites, you know, talk to trusted people that you think can, and can add to the project and can be great team members. Um, yeah, just don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Greg, how about you? Um, I wanted to touch on something Rachel brought up early on, which is that part of learning to, to write is learning the proper format for a screenplay. I can't tell you how important it is because if you don't know how to format a screenplay, that means you haven't been reading the books on screenwriting. You haven't been studying screenwriting. You haven't been doing the basic homework. I can't tell you how many people ask me to read their script, critique it, which really just means they want me to tell them how great it is and how talented they are. When in fact, the most productive thing someone can do 
is tear your script apart and show you every way that you don't know what you're doing and you have to go back to square one. I get so many scripts from people that I agree to take time out of my schedule, my busy time, to do this, to read their script, and they haven't learned basic formatting. And what I typically do is, I used to do the first 10 pages, now we do the first page, is I format it the way it should be, I send it back to them, and I say, when you've done the whole script, like what I've just given you, send it back to me. I've done this eight, nine times. Not one of those people has ever bothered to then go out and learn how to write the screenplay and send it back to me. So there is homework involved. There's learning involved. It doesn't have to be film school. It can be tutorials. It can be books. It can be on-set experience. But you have to learn the basics if you're going to convince people around you that you know what you're doing. That means money people. That means crew people. That means actors. They don't want to look at something that they know is wrong and then put their faith in you. They want to know that you know the basics. Um, now, you don't have to follow all the rules of screenwriting, um, but you have to know what they are so that if you're breaking those rules because of an artistic idea, um, it's intentional and it's not because you're an amateur. And by amateur, I don't mean that you're not getting paid. I mean that you won't do the homework, that you won't do the work. I have actor friends who gripe all the time about how they're not cast in films. And I'll say, well, do you have an actor's access account? No. Do you have a headshot? No. <laughs> have people who want roles, and I say, send me a headshot or send me at least a selfie, you know, that's well lit so I can see what you look like. And I get photos of them and their friends hanging out in a car. It, <laughs> it just tells me, even if they have some talent, that they're not serious about what they're doing. They're not presenting themselves in a way that shows me that, yeah, this is somebody I want to work with, somebody who's going to take it seriously, someone who I can count on. Um, so that was just what I wanted to say about what, what Rachel had mentioned earlier. Uh, my advice to filmmakers is, uh, besides doing that basic homework, be passionate about the story you want to tell. Make sure you're making a movie for a reason. Surround yourself with the best people you can. Not just your friends, um, but people who are going to bring something to the game, to the table, who are going to make you look good by extension, because they're going to uh, bring skills that you, that you probably don't have yourself. Don't be afraid to listen to those people. I mean, everybody had, they're doing this for creative reasons too, not just because they want to be part of the set. They want to uh, contribute. Listen to them. They may be wrong. And that, because that's my final point, but hear them out, hear what they have to say, give their, their suggestions consideration. Don't dismiss them because then you're creating bad feelings on the set. But then at the end of the day, it's your decision and you can't be afraid to tell them that. So make sure you listen to people. But if your gut tells you to go a different direction, make sure you follow your gut. Um, I've worked with, with really talented professional people and I've cut scenes from my movies just because I allowed them to convince me to shoot it a different way than what I had in mind. And, and when I watch it in the editing, I'm like, why didn't we do it? If I can get rid of it, then I do. Film is forever and you have to live with these compromises. And if you don't have to make a compromise, don't do it. Awesome, thank you guys so much. Um, so now we'll open it up to the Q&A. If anybody has any questions, you can feel free to type it in the chat or you can unmute yourself, turn your camera on, and you can ask the question yourself. You already have a question in the chat. She messaged me privately. She said, disregard that question. Her question is, what advice would you have for those who want to direct, produce, have creative input on small indie films, but do not have the writing bug themselves, aside from just getting involved in meeting people and any other ideas? Well, you need a talented collaborator then who does want to write, or you need to know a lot of writers, someone like Kyle Furchin, who is uh, writing screenplays, um, who maybe uh, has something in common with you. Uh, most people who produce or direct know other people who write, and when you go to a movie afterwards and go out to eat, you kick around ideas, and, and this is how projects start. Not everyone is a writer-director. It always shocks me when I hear that there's a director that doesn't like to write. And I do, I have met directors that, you know, they're like, I can't write, but it's just so shocking to me because it's like, you're, you're a storyteller. 
you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, maybe you can't write in terms of like grammar or formatting or something like that. But if you can convey an idea to somebody who can turn that into a screenplay, you know, then you're a co-writer <laughs> or, you know, at least the concept is based on what you're talking about. Um, I mean, that, the, the producer, the director, and the writer, that's the, that's the team. So, uh, you know, everything starts at the screenplay. If you don't have a good story, I don't care if you got great acting, you know, if the movie looks good, the sounds great, it doesn't matter. If the story sucks, the movie's going to suck. So, you know, you definitely have to find the right writer. Yeah, I'll piggyback off that and say the right writer, the right circumstance, I mean, I pitched my film that I did to the person maybe about two or three times until it finally clicked and we had the right story. And it was just like, okay. It usually, and it flows that way too. So I agree with both these guys, definitely. Yeah, I had, um, Greg, you know, Hope Milbauer, you know, and uh, she was 16 years old when uh, she directed, wrote, directed, and, and produced her first feature film. She's from Niagara Falls. And uh, her her parents, I, I was working with her father at the time. And, um, you know, he was like, Oh, I want to, I want to ask you if you help with our daughter's short film that she wants to make. And when he told me the idea, I was like, look, man, she can make a feature if she just breaks it up into shorts and puts it together, you know, like does it that way. Um, but she wrote it and she directed it and I came on to produce it. I shot it. So it looked good, but you know, it was her idea. It was her brain that, you know, created that. And it was important to me to see a female filmmaker, you know, coming from my hometown that uh, had this idea. I think it was a great movie. It's called I Dare You to Open Your Eyes. Um, but my point is that a producer should really just be someone that helps the movie get made. You know, there's somebody that, that lends all the assistance they can to production. Um, if if your question is that you're you're looking to produce more then you know somebody like hope who's talented but doesn't have the resources to do it on her own you know the diamond in the rough um if you're looking to direct and somebody uh lets you direct their script that's a little different you know uh, like greg i get i get messages every single week for screenplays i don't even read them greg i don't know how you do but uh there's in this area, there's thousands of people that have, have ideas and screenplays. So all you would really have to do is go on Facebook and say, Hey, who's got a script that, that they want me to produce and direct and you'll get <laughs> flooded with, with people. Awesome. Any other questions? Oh, I have something in the chat. I would just like to say I am available to assist on any projects coming up as an extra or behind the scenes. I have 20 plus years experience and I'm willing and eager to learn. Awesome. And the next message says how to find good non-SAG actors. So I know a lot of you mentioned casting locally. How, how did you go about that? Did you put out a blast on social media? Did you reach out to local theater companies? How did you go about that? Whoever wants to answer. Rachel. <laughs> I was going to say, go ahead, Greg. <laughs> I was going to say, there's, uh, yeah, social media is the big giant in this. Like, there's plenty, plenty of groups. There's uh, uh, the Buffalo Niagara, like, you know, film professionals group. There's the uh, Buffalo Extras group. There's so many ways to connect with actors that are non union um, just by, you know, seeing what the community is like going on to theater websites and seeing who their cast members are past cast members how to reach out to them um, but buffalo is fortunate we have a lot of people that would like to be involved in um, acting and and on film so if you can find those facebook groups if you can connect with people through um just like on the ground in different communities then you'll find you'll find the actors because they're out there I, i'd recommend theater definitely looking into those resources um they're there they're waiting to be a part of the the industry too so networking on those facebook groups is really important um i started buffalo niagara film professionals with a few other people i don't know eight nine years ago three thousand members now uh western new york actors helping actors. I, I see serious discussions 
Buffalo Film Actors, those three, and, and networking in general. You know, once you work on projects, you meet people, you interact with them, and it just becomes a spider web that goes out. And you find people that you want to work with, and people find you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And and also looking for actors uh, who are not overused, you know, because um, it's possible to find people who don't have, uh, who haven't had the, the chance to show people what they could do. And uh, maybe they're not on Facebook, maybe they're in a theater group or, you know, word of mouth, but it's very easy to find actors. Uh, that's one of the easiest things is you just put a casting call out. Um, I know I share casting calls all the time on our company page. We have like 2,500 likes. So it's, you know, those get out there and uh, you know, you wouldn't believe how many people just in our population in this region want to try their hand at acting. So uh, non sag just means everyone else, right? <laughs> it could be Greg. You know, it's a, it, it, you just want somebody that fits the bill that can deliver a performance that has the look that's um, reliable. They're a, kind of a dime a dozen, um, it, it, but finding someone that could actually act that's that's when it you know you have to do digital casting calls and stuff that's hard, and someone who can be available you yeah. know as much as you need them. That's often the challenge if people have jobs, so yeah. I just put the links to the Facebook groups that Greg mentioned in the chat, and I'll include them in the email that we send out um, with the YouTube link to the recording of this video for anyone who missed it. Um, but if anyone has any last questions, feel free to unmute yourself or drop it in the chat. Let me. Oh, I just had a quick question. Um, ahead, so this, this is mostly for um, when you're pitching ideas to investors. So if you do find investors, is there certain elements when you're pitching a feature that you think investors respond better to? Like, would you bring in like a, a teaser poster or storyboards or like a pitch book? Um, I, Greg, I heard you did like a reel, like a short little reel for Guns, and e Guns of Eden. Um, is there any of those elements that you would recommend doing would you recommend doing all of them or not wasting your time with some of them because they don't work i'm just curious about like what your your pitch elements are when when in, uh pitching to investors i think a look a lookbook has become increasingly important um and played a key role in my last few films because you can have some artwork you can tell the story in a page an investor doesn't necessarily understand a screenplay you know, that they get thrown off by the format right away. Uh, something that they can look at and digest and, you know, some links to the, the New York State Film Production Tax Credit are always helpful. Um, I think also what's really important, again, networking. If you have somebody who can act as a middleman between you and somebody who has a lot of money so that they know you're a straight shooter, because, you know, most of us don't play poker with people who have a million dollars in their bank account or $10 million. So finding people who can help you find those people is really important and getting the recommendation. Um, I would caution everybody that every person who has real money, usually as a financial advisor, and they're gonna tell per a person that a film is a horrible way to go. Um, so right now, I mean, my, my method is changing a little bit. But like I said, I'm, I'm crowdfunding this film, but the next one will be with investors. You really want to appeal to the people who want to be involved in a film, where that's more important to them than the financial end. You know, unless you're talking about a $10 million film, in which case they want to know about that money. But Ken mentioned earlier, you know, you've got to let people know it's going to take a few years before they even start seeing money. So at least three years before they start seeing some money. Um, unless you qualify for the tax credit. And now the tax credit is so important that it, once you submit your paperwork, and that's a lot of work, it's two years before you get a check. So people have, your investors have to know it's for the long haul and it's in your favor to be upfront with them. Number one, it, it shows you're uh, an honest person. And number two, you don't want somebody who, who you're into for a lot of money saying 12 months later, when do we see the money? Because yeah. it's got, they have to understand it's a long process. But a lookbook, I, I I find is very helpful right now. Yeah, I um, so I just I just handed a check, a royalty payment to uh, 
one of our investors a couple of weeks ago and he was super happy to see it, but he's been in it for the long haul. And then I'm sitting down with an investor next week. And with this one, I pretty much already had the investment secured because I've been, you know, working with him before the, the actual investment meeting. Um, as far as materials go, uh, lookbook definitely. I mean, you want to have all your materials, so they're not going to read a screenplay. Maybe they'll read a treatment. Maybe they'll read a short synopsis. Um, you know, I've been so deep into uh, preparing packages for studios that you know I haven't been into this realm of like independent investors for a couple of years. But now, you know, that's where the money is at locally. So uh, I, the first thing that I do when I come in, I always tell them it's a high risk investment. Number one, you know, like there's no shyster business. There's no like trying to schmooze them like that. It's like, look, you probably won't recoup. And if you do, it probably won't be much of a profit. But there's also the chance that it hits. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you're talking to people who have money like that, they like to gamble, you know, they, they like to splurge. Um, a financial advisor, definitely. And those people, uh, the investors, they didn't get that amount of wealth by giving it away. So, you know, in terms of being an investment, they'd probably rather invest in something that, you know, they know they're going to get a profit from. Um, but you had the way that you package yourself when you go into that, like right now, as I was saying earlier with the Buffalo Niagara film industry, people are trying to get in the door of producing you know, they don't, I'm not talking about crew. I'm not talking about cast. I'm talking about uh, financial guys and, and women that uh, they want to play the game. They see the game is happening. Maybe mostly I'm seeing it in real estate. You know, we have a lot of big developers here in the falls that it's, it's, it's pretty nasty here. Um, all of those guys want to get in. There's gatekeepers. Uh, the easiest way for them to, to get in is to hand me some money and, and be a producer on a movie that I'm making. And now, Hey, now you're in the film industry. So they're actually buying a piece of your movie. You know, I mean, it's great if you could offer them points and you know, everything plus their ROI, but uh, I see the highest value right now where the mark and I, I get white pages all the time. I got advisors and consultants. I'm on the phone with four or five hours a day, every single day. Um, what I'm seeing where the money is coming from is people that want to play the game in this area. They see the boom. Imagine if you can invest in Warner brothers before, you know, before it was Hollywood, you know, and a lot of people don't know that Warner brothers actually started in Buffalo. A lot of people don't know that, but in 1891 Warner brothers, uh, had two offices. One was in Buffalo. That one burnt down and they shifted everything to Burbank. So we have the potential to have Hollywood here like a Hollywood type industry here for somebody. And you have to have the numbers too. You can't just have your, uh, your lookbook. You can't just have, you know, all your data. You have to have your projections too. And if you can come in and you can say, okay, look, you know, this is what it's going to cost us to take it to the European film market or, you know, to hire a sales agent and all the back end costs and all that, you know, you're talking their language because most of the time these are not artists, they're, they're usually just business people, you know, um, they feel more comfortable. How do you get from A to Z, you know, and you give them the entire alphabet to get to that ROI. You don't just say, well, we're going to take it to a film festival and hopefully we get a distributor. <laughs> you know, that doesn't work. You, you have to lay everything out for them. Um, I also find that in those meetings that you don't want to lay it out on the table first you know, you don't want to hand them like this bulky package or a folder or whatever that you have. You, you want to talk to them. And then after you've explained things, put that in front of them because otherwise they're distracted. So I, hopefully those are some tips that'll help you. Follow up on one more thing that, that you're going to need. If, if you're contacting people with money, serious people with money. Um, I mentioned section 168 earlier, which is the next step in terms of getting a tax write-off for investors so that they have a financial reason to want to get involved. To do something like Section 168 or before that, um, I don't remember what the last incentive I was looking at, but I, I was turned off by it ultimately. But one of the things you need after a lookbook, when somebody's interested, you need 
a PPM, which is a private placement memorandum, which is an elaborate legal document. Uh, it costs $7,000 just to make this document. And one of the things it does is it makes sure that you are clear of any SEC violations. It makes sure that all of your investors have been deemed qualified investors, meaning they won't go broke if they lose money on your film. Once you get to a higher level, these are things that you need, you need to have. And, um, you know, I would advise getting somebody with seed money who's willing to front that legal document. That's great. But you still want to have your investors lined up even before you commission this work from an entertainment lawyer. It's got to be an entertainment lawyer. And then it'll take them two months to get it to you and they tailor everything. But that's the final step you need before an investor for serious money is going to look at your project. Now, I, I haven't done one yet. I almost did one for, for my last film, but I was uh, two months out and I had the money lined up. I just didn't need that extra incentive of some sort of a write-off to get it made. Um, but before I would go to an investor now, I would definitely look at every possible um, write-off that would appeal to them. And this is what there is right now. And it's a big deal because films are traditionally the worst um, investments to write off. Uh, Ronald Reagan made sure that Ronald Reagan was a studio actor. He was friends with the studios. And when there, while there were tax write-offs in the United States, once Reagan came into office as a favor to his friends, the studios, he changed the tax laws so that you could not write off your film investment. You could only do it if after a certain number of years, an investor could look at how much money they lost and they would, um, amortize it. They would spread it out over the years. So there would be a small percentage that they could write off over years. And that's the reason that films are a terrible, terrible investment. The okay. section 168, which will not be uh, active forever. It's a continuation of section 181, which Obama did as part of his stimulus package. And I think he kept it around for three or four years. Uh, it's the same thing with this, most likely. It's, it's here to get us through these lean times. So now is the time to go after this no telling how long it's going to stay active. Um, but it's the best thing to appeal to an investor who's looking to write off or recoup their money. So it's a big deal. Let's yeah. take this last question just because we're, we're running a bit late here. Um, the last question in the chat is how to find locations like banks, jails, et cetera, and after finding them, how to lock them in. Ken, you're <laughs> Yeah. Deal, deal a lot with that. Uh, well, are, are you insured? You know, do you have an LLC or, you know, S Corp or something? Are you insured? Uh, I mean, it, it depends. Uh, it depends on your needs, but you can speak with the owner of uh, the location or the manager of the location. You could go to the film office if, uh, you know, if you're in Buffalo or you have a, a, a bigger location that, um, you know, is unobtainable. Uh, like if you if you want to shoot in the state parks, you have to go through the state parks. You have to go through Angela Birdie. They're going to look at all your paperwork and make sure that you're legit. Um, really, what I find is that people just care mostly about insurance. And um, and then it comes down to whether or not you're going to inconvenience them. So if you're filming in a bank, that's kind of tough because, you know, some banks are closed on like, you know, Saturday after three or something. And that's the only time that you could film. I know if you want to shoot at like Fort Niagara, uh, they generally want you to film like after hours or before hours, which is difficult. Um, and so I personally being a guerrilla filmmaker, I like to find like a jail that is no longer in use um, because I don't have to worry about people, um, you know, or, or I will build a bank out of an office building or something. Um, but if you can get it great, it's just that there's a lot of hassle to, to deal with uh, the public and, and live locations like that. Rachel, did you want to hop on that one too? I know you said you shot at a police station. Is that what you mentioned earlier? Yeah, yeah. Ken knows the police station. He helped facilitate that. Uh, so yeah, um, it's really knowing who to talk to and who might have access to those locations. Uh, Bill Kennedy helped us to get uh, access to that location. So. Um, through their studio, uh, both Ken and him. It's just more helpful to know people that can get you where you got to go and that have the resource. Uh, so that's, that's what I would add on, definitely. 
Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, like I mentioned at the start, this seminar will be benefiting the American Diabetes Association. I copy and pasted the link to donate. I'll send it again right now. Um, and I will also attach it to the email that we're going to send out with the recording in case anybody couldn't be here in real time. But thank you so much to Ken, Greg, and Rachel for all sharing their experiences with us today. And hopefully we'll see you all on the next one. Thank you, everyone. Good job, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. This is great.